ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله ولي الصالحين ونشهد أن سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد عبد الله ورسوله الأمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين وصحبه الطيبين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد sitting in the seat that I'm sitting in right now and have been sitting for the past few weeks is not a pleasure. It's not something to take pride in that one sits here and you have to dig out cows out of history things that, 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 should, that should have been forgotten, issues that should have been passed by and should have been eradicated from the collective memory of Muslims in particular, humanity in general. Why is it that we find it necessary to go back to history constantly? Why can we not do as we are asked to do? Take the Shia at face value. Don't go back to their books. Don't look into the books. Ask the Shia themselves. Why can we not accept that Shiism is dynamic, that it changes with the times, that what was said yesterday does not necessarily hold true for today any longer. If it was possible that we could have taken such a path, that we could have simply shed the past and said that let the, let the past deal with itself. We will only deal with the present. We will not concern ourselves with what happened once upon a time, but we are concerned exclusively with the present and with the future. Where will Islam go from here onwards and let's forget the past. If we could have done that, then it might have been possible that we could make our friends on the other side of the Sunni Shia divide very happy. The question is, are they prepared to let go of the past? We might have been prepared to let go of the past. The question is, are they prepared to let go of the past? If they were prepared to let go of the past, then none of those issues would still be existing today. Had they been prepared to let go of all of that, and when I speak about all of that, I speak about the aqidah, I speak about the fiqh, and I speak about the interpretation, and about the specific approach to history. Had they been prepared to forego all of that, to break the link with whatever there was, we would have been equally prepared to do the same. The fact of the matter is, in any religious community, Continuity is of the utmost importance. What do we mean by continuity? You define yourselves by the roots that you come from. We cannot simply say that let the past be the past. We are going to change everything. From this moment onwards, things are going to be different. For reasons which we will seek, inshallah, to spell out in this particular lecture of ours, we believe that to say that let go of the past, don't go back to the books any longer, don't go and dig out what is there. We believe that this is nothing but a smoke screen or a ruse. Something designed to create a pretext, something designed to be a smoke screen, under cover of which the propagation of that very same Shiism of yesterday will continue unabated. Therefore we cannot afford to let go of the past. Similarly, the Shia themselves too cannot let go of the past, will never let go of the past. You will see it within a few weeks from now. And every year in the first week, the first 10 days of Muharram, the lectures that are given building up from the first night to the second night to the third night, eventually culminating on the day of Ashura, the constant repetition of what happened once upon a time in the past, the constant repetition of a story of martyrdom and betrayal, that constant retelling, that incessant recollection of an event of the past, that in itself tells us that the Shia will never be prepared to let go of the past.
Therefore, we cannot do the same. We have to know the past in order to know where the future is, in order to know from here where the future, uh, uh, where the present is rather, and to know where the future is going to go from here. We have looked at the concept of imama, defined it, looked at the various putative Quranic roots, alleged Quranic roots for it, and show how none of that was applicable. What we have been doing over the past few weeks has caused quite a bit of disturbance. There's been quite a bit of turbulence in the air. People have taken to this particular program in different ways. The numbers with which people such as yourselves have responded week after week after week show that there is a great, there is a great interest, an interest that still hasn't flagged. On the other hand, there are others who have taken offense. And they have taken offense to the extent that post-mortems are being done over the air, publicly, naming names, quoting words. Why so? It's because we've been trampling upon certain very, very sensitive toes. Certain toes that do not want to be trampled upon. From the beginning we have said that there are two faces to Shiism. There's the very nice side about it. And for those who are interested in that particular side, there are those who dispense it to them. But there is another side to Shiism, which everyone has a right, and not only a right, but under present circumstances, a duty to know about. And that is why we have undertaken this particular program in order to make everyone aware of the fact that there is another side. And if that side won't be told from this particular platform, no one is going to tell it. Therefore, despite the turbulence, despite the opposition, despite the disturbance in the air, we have decided to go ahead. For which reason? Because you have a right to know. Because our society has a need to know that there is another side to these issues. Coming back to our topic, Imama. Imama, as we have seen, is the belief that Allah Ta'ala has appointed after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a number of rulers of this Ummah. The Ummah has no right to decide to elect rulers on its own account. It has to accept those particular rulers appointed by Allah Ta'ala. As it has no right to select a Nabi, it has no right to select the successor of a Nabi. You and I have grown up on a system of belief whereby Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was elected as the Khalifa after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Umar after him and Uthman after him and Ali ibn Abi Talib after him. The Shia have a completely different approach. They say that that leader is divinely appointed. So from there we learn that they have this belief called Imama. Today we want to go into another aspect of this belief of Imama. Imama means then belief in the divine right of the Ahlul Bayt. And when we speak about the Ahlul Bayt here, then in Shia uh, uh, parlance, in their particular language, it means that twelve, those 12 Imams from the Ahlul Bayt. Not the rest of the Ahlul Bayt, not the other children of those particular Imams, but only that particular line. Allegiance to that line. Allegiance to those Imams of the Ahlul Bayt whom they believe appointed by Allah Ta'ala starting from Ali ibn Abi Talib passing through Hassan, his son, uh, uh, the other son Hussein, and then nine from the children of Hussein, one after the other until they reach the twelfth on whom they believe to be an occultation. Now, part of that belief of Imama is something called Wala. There is something called Wala. What is that Wala? Or Wilaya, as it is also called sometimes. It means to adopt a particular attitude towards that Imam. It is an attitude of support, an attitude of love, of respect, of dedication. You are, a res you are respectful, a loving, and a dedicated member of the party of that Imam. Wala, by its very nature and by the way it has been unpacked and explained by the Shia themselves, has another angle to it. A concomitant, a corollary angle, something that goes together with it at the same time. And that other angle is called bara. Sometimes they refer to these two terms as tawalli and tabarri. Sometimes they refer to them as wala and bara. To explain it better, it just so happens this morning I was standing in a queue. People will understand this kind of example because this kind of issues that goes about in society. I'm standing in a queue and two chaps are speaking in front of me. The one is wearing an all blacks jersey. 
So the other one starts speaking to you and say, where did you buy this jersey? He said, no, the waterfront, that's the funkel, that's the dagekop. And they're talking, they're talking, the one tells the other, you know what? Uh, I've got a Springbok jersey. But they'll tell you one thing about the Springbok jersey. It's very, very good for washing your car. Nothing washes a car as well as a Springbok jersey. Now what I want to point out to you, this is an example of wala and bara in action. Because the person has so much support for the one side, automatically even the jersey of the other side is not good enough any longer. The jersey is only good enough for washing a car. Next lot your car so lekka blank so so sprungbok jersey ni. This is more or less the direct words of this person. This is wala and bara. You're such an all black supporter that even the jersey of the other side, forget the players, forget uh, the manager, forget everything else, even the jersey is not good enough. Now this is what happens in wala and bara. Your love and respect of the Ahlul Bayt becomes so severe, so exaggerated, that those whom you conceive to be the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt are the worst that you can find under the sun. So it is a love-hate complex. It is a matter of loving the one to such an extent that you go beyond the acceptable limits. What do we mean by beyond the acceptable limits? You raise them even above the status of the Anbiya alayhimu salatu wasalam, as we have seen. That's exaggeration on the one side. Such exaggeration can never be without its concomitant, its corollary. What is that corollary? Such exaggerated love will inevitably go side by side, hand in hand with exaggerated hatred. And to who will that hatred be? To who that hatred be? That hatred would be to those whom you then as a Shi'i conceive of as the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. The Ahlul Bayt, you love them to the extent that you take them to the level above that of the Anbiya. Therefore, the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt, you have to hate them to a similar extent. Where you take them to levels even below that of Shaitan. In this regard, Wala and Bara are intrinsically part of Shi'i thought. They cannot be divorced from it to the extent that Shi'i writers such as Mullah Baqir, Majlisi and others have said that this kind of approach whereby you love the one and you hate the other is inseparable from Shi'i thought is one of the undeniable aspects of Shi'ism. You cannot be a real Shi'i if you do not love the one to bits and hate the other one to excess as well. This is not an ancient belief. This belief continues within the Shia up to the present day as well. As much as they would not like us to speak about it, as much as the, it would make them uncomfortable to hear things such of this nature being spoken in a public forum, we have a right and we have a need to know about these things. Why? Because that same Shiism which espouses beliefs such as this is still knocking on our doors today and telling us that your belief is not the right one, come over to our side. So we have a right to know. This belief does not belong to ancient Shiism alone. It was there once upon a time. It found its, exp its expression in the worst possible ways once upon a time. It continues today. In the present time it continues. I would want to make mention of one. There's, there's such a lot to quote. But one specific incident. It goes back to about 10 years from now about 10-12 years from now, in the city of Qum. Now the city of Qum would be in the, probably the, one of the two most important academic cities for the Shia, where their madaris, their universities, their Dar al ulums as such are two major cities in the Shia world. One in Iran, one in Iraq. In Iraq there is a city of Najaf, where they believe Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib lies buried. In Iran there is a city of Qum. The city of Qum is where they believe one of the descendants of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, a lady called al Masuma, she lies buried there. Anyway, that became their major intellectual and academic center in Iran. That's where all their students go to study. In the city, now the city is full of what? Full of students, full of scholars. Wherever you look, you will find them. In this particular city, one of the senior ayatollahs of the city is someone called Ayatollah Hussein Wahid al-Khurasani. One of the oldest, most senior scholars of the city of Qum. I think he is still alive. At the time when he made these statements, he was very close to his late 80s already. Allahu alam. 
Anyway, I'm going to read out. He was speaking to who? He was speaking to the students of the city of Qum. He was speaking to those students and telling them what are their duties when they return to their various countries. He says, إِنَّ وَظِيفَتَكُمُ الْأَسَاسِيَّةِ تَتَلَخَّصُ فِي أَمْرَيْنِ Your most basic and essential duty, it boils down to two points and two points alone. When you go away from here, these are now the Sunni, the, the, the Shi'i students, tomorrow to become the ulama of the Shi'i world. Your duty is as simple, it can be reduced to two things and two things alone. The first is, غَرْصُ بِذْرَةِ مَحَبَّةِ عَلِيٍّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ فِي الْقُلُوبِ you must go out into the world and implant the seed of the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib and thereafter, thereafter the Ahlul Bayt in the hearts of people. Now, there's not much opposition that can, I can have to an idea such as that. Ali ibn Abi Talib is someone very close to our hearts as well. Ali ibn Abi Talib to us is the son of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his cousin and the fourth of the Khulafa al-Rashidin. So, implanting the, the love of Ali ibn Abi Talib in the hearts of people, something we can identify with. Something that resonates well with us. The second part, however, أن نعمل بنفس المستوى والمقدار ودون قيد أنملة من فارق أو تفاوت مع الأمر الأول. Together with this first one, we have to make as much effort with the same degree of dedication, with that same degree. Equal in every respect to the first one. There's another seed that we have to implant in the hearts of people as well. To the same extent, we have to work equally hard to plant in the hearts the hatred of those who deprived Ali of the Khilafah. As much as we must work, he tells those students, to implant the love of Ali, radiallahu anhu, we must work equally hard without one finger length of difference to implant within the hearts of the people of this ummah the hatred of those who deprived Ali of the Khilafah. وَعْلَمُوا He's not finished. He tells those students, أَنَّ الْأُمَّةَ جَمْعَاءَ Be aware, he tells them, that this entire ummah سَتُبْلَى بِلَعْنَةٍ وَنِقْمَةٍ شَامِلَةٍ لَا يُعْلَمُ مَا وَرَاءَهَا إِذَا ظَهَرَ بَيْنَ التَّوَلِّي وَالتَّبَرِّي تَفَاوَتٌ مَا أَوْ بَرَزَ شَيْءٌ مِّنَ الْفَارِقِ بَيْنَهُمَا وَلَوْ بِقَدْرِ مِثْقَالِ ذَرَّةٍ He says that if the love of Ali and the hatred of the enemies of Ali are not equal to the last atom, then this ummah must know that Allah's la'na is going to descend upon them. Such a lana, such a curse is going to descend upon them that they do not know what lies beyond it. Therefore, one, when one looks at it in this way, what remains to speak about when you say we have to have unity with one another? If such ideas are imprinted into the minds of the Shia students graduating, going out into the, into the world thereafter, when they, are, when they are taught, when it is imprinted in their minds, that hatred of those conceived of as having deprived Ali of his, uh, of his Khilafah must be implanted in every Muslim heart. How does it come about? Why is it that they have such deep rancor and hatred in their hearts for those people whom Allah Ta'ala had said? When, when you speak of them, what must you say? رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَا بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا That we have to make istighfar for ourselves first. Then we have to make istighfar for them. And we say, Ya Allah, do not place any hatred in our hearts. There are hearts that are filled to capacity with hatred of those people. Why is it such? Why must it be such? It is such because of this very idea of what? Of Imama. This idea of Imama is not an innocent idea. It's not something that says simply love the Ahlul Bayt. It says at the same time, hate those who are the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. Those must be hated because that is one of the implications of this Imama that the Shia believe in. The Ahadith, the books of Ahadith of the Shia are filled once again to capacity with Ahadith in which they speak of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum in ways that you and I will find it very, very difficult to stomach. When Sheikh Irfan asked me the question on the way here, the question that he had mentioned to you, that question, I think anyone who has studied Shiism to some extent will know that the very first idea you get when you start delving deep into the books of the Shia is that 
anger in your heart. Why is it such? Why must people say such things? Why is it such that a member uh, of those who claim themselves to be the followers of the Imams, he must come to Imam Zainul Abidin and ask him that, Oh Imam, tell me about these two people. Tell me about Abu Bakr and Umar. What must I think about them? And he says, Kafirani kafirun man tawallahuma. That each one of them is a kafir and anyone who believes them to be good is a kafir along with them. Why is it always a concept of hatred and love? Hatred to the extreme, love to the extreme. Why must it be such? Is it possible that those two things could actually be divorced from one another? If that is possible, then the route to unity is open. If that's not possible, then the, un of un the route to unity will never remain open. We're not saying that it's impossible to have this kind of unity. But in order to have that unity, we must go back to what we spoke about last week. That it is very, very possible to have unity. If the Shia from within themselves are prepared to have dialogue and decide, what do you really believe? Every year we find the Muharram celebrations come along. Not celebrations, the commemorations they would say. Those commemorations of Muharram whereby they recollect every year, year after year, the things that, the very, very sad things that befell the Ahlul Bayt. What is it that they speak about there? They speak about the murder of Sayyidina al Hussein at Karbala. It's a very, very sad event. But beyond it, what lies connected with it? Is that only the death of Sayyidina al Hussein, the murder of Sayyidina al Hussein at Karbala by Yazid and his evil minions? Is that all that it is all about? Listen to some of the other hadith of the Shia. They say a person comes again to Imam Zainul Abidin. Allah knows that Imam Zainul Abidin never spoke words such as these. But a person comes to Imam Zainul Abidin and asks him, Tell me again about Abu Bakr and Umar. He says, Ma qatarat qatratum min damina wala dami ahadim min al muslimina illa wahiya fi a'naqihi ma ila yawmil qiyama. No drop of blood has ever been shed of our blood of the Ahlul Bayt or any other blood of any other Muslim. From now to the day of Qiyamah, except that who is responsible for it? Abu Bakr and Umar is responsible for it. They are the ones that... So when that commemoration takes place, it is something that purports to be an occasion whereby they vent the anger against Yazid and against Shimr and against Umar ibn Sa'd and those people who were involved in the kill killing of Sayyidina al Hussein. It goes beyond that. It goes far beyond that. Where does it go? From there it starts. It says that the, this is but the outcome. This is only the eventual fruit of something, of a seed that was planted many, many years before that. Which seed was that? That was a seed planted the day Abu Bakr took the Khilafah. That was the first injustice shown to the Ahlul Bayt. It is on account of that first injustice that all these other injustices occurred afterwards. And therefore... When we curse Yazid, they say, we curse together with him who? Abu Bakr must be cursed as well. Umar must be cursed as well. In fact, Yazid is but a small fry compared to those two other ones whom the Ahadith go on to say that in Jahannam there is a very, very special pit. There is a very, very special well. That well is such that when Jahannam starts losing its intense heat, when it starts losing the intensity of his heat, and Allah wants to make that heat more, increase that intensity. Then and only then, the lid of that particular well is lifted. When the lid of that well is lifted, the heat that emanates from there increases the intensity of Jahannam all over. That but is kept for Abu Bakr and for Umar alone. That is only for Abu Bakr and Umar. No, that's for them. Their daraja in Jahannam is lower than that of Shaitan. Shaitan will have a good time in Jahannam compared to what the two of them will get. Now, there's a certain picture coming across here. This is not the Abu Bakr and Umar that you know, I know of. This is not the Abu Bakr and Umar that, as I said once before, Gandhi, the non-Muslim, could tell the first group of ministers of independent India, if you want to know how to conduct yourself as a ruler of a state, look at the example of those two. Look at Abu Bakr and Umar. That's what a just ruler is like. Here we're getting a completely different picture. This doesn't only belong to ancient history, this belongs to Shia ulama living alive and kicking today. This is Khomeini and his students. This is just about every Shi'i walking out there. 
However, when we face them, when we come face to, uh, face to face with them, we're getting a different picture. Not too long ago, at UCT, there was an incident. So there was a pamphlet published, and then there was a response to that pamphlet. The response to that pamphlet came from the Ahlul Bayt Foundation in Devet Road. And the response to that pamphlet states that we, the Shia, have no hatred in our hearts for Hadrat Abu Bakr and Hadrat Umar. Now, is this a reformist attitude? Is this now a Shi'i who has decided that all of this of the past, we have been wrong, we should not have said all of these things? Or is this a case of plain and simple deception? If we want to know what it is really about, let's look at how the Shi'a view the Imams. How they view the Imams and how do they say, what teachings, what are the teachings that the Imams gave them? A code of life to live by. A few incidents. One incident perhaps will, uh, perhaps will suffice to tell us how is it that they conceive of these Imams? What kind of people are they? This question of Abu Bakr and Umar has been a very, very sensitive and central question. We saw last week, I mentioned the incident of Sayyidina Zayd ibn Ali ibn al Hussein, who led a jihad, was abandoned by 40,000 Shia simply because he said something good about Abu Bakr and Umar. This was a constant question going around. Every now and then the same question came up. The same question came up in the time of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. When he heard people saying that he is better than Abu Bakr and Umar, he says, لا أتين برجل يفضلني على أبي بكر وعمر إلا جلت حد القذف. If someone comes to me and say that I'm better than Abu Bakr and Umar, I'm going to give him 40 or 80 lashes. 80 lashes I'm going to give him. That was Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib in his time. The Shia say no, that was merely a case of taqiyya. He was only saying so to deceive someone. A similar story, Zainul Abidin, his grandson, someone comes to him and asks him about Abu Bakr, oh no, sorry, not Zainul Abidin, this was Jafar al-Sadiq. Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, it is claimed that someone comes to Imam Jafar al-Sadiq and says that, tell me about Abu Bakr and Umar. So Imam Jafar al-Sadiq says that, Huma imamani adilani qasitani kana ala al-haqq fama ta'alay. The person says, Alhamdulillah, you've spoken the truth. They, they were, those were two imams, just imams, fair imams. They were upon haqq and they died upon haqq. The person goes away. The others sitting there, they ask the imam, how come you gave a person such an answer? All along we've heard a different kind of story. Why are you giving him an answer? And he chuckles and he smiles and he laughs. He says, leave these people. They don't understand what I said. So, so what did you say? He says, you know, I said, kana huma imaman. They are imams. Well, certainly they are imams. Because Allah says in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَدْعُونَ إِلَى النَّارِ They are those imams that call towards the fire. And what else did I say? I said, عَادِلًا You and I, when we are there, عَدَلَ يَعْدِلُ What does it mean? It means to be just. He says, نَيْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ يَعْدِلُونَ عَدَلَ there means what? To make shirk with Allah. So not adil in the sense of someone who is just, but someone who does what? ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ يَعْدِلُونَ Those are people who equate others with Allah. And then I said thirdly, قَاسِطَان You might think قَاسِطَان comes from the word قِسْط, which also means justice. He says, no. أَمَّا الْقَاسِطُونَ فَكَانُوا لِجَهَنَّمَ حَطَبًا The قَاسِط, it means that those are, those are those unjust people who will be the fuel of Jahannam one day. And then I said, كَانَا عَلَى الْحَقِّ They were upon a haqq. It's like we say, they took the haqq away and they were sitting upon it. And they died sitting upon the haqq. That haqq belonged to Ali ibn Abi Talib. It wasn't their haqq. You're getting the impression of a person here who is speaking in what? In two tongues. Speaking in order to deceive people. Telling a person something and meaning something else by it. This is exactly the doctrine of taqiyya. This is the doctrine of taqiyya. Why is taqiyya used? We will hear people speaking very, very glowingly about taqiyya and how necessary is it to make taqiyya. But taqiyya to a person such as this who asks you a simple question about Abu Bakr and Umar and you speak in a folk tongue to do what? Was he going to do any harm to you? I want to tell you something else. At that time when Imam Jafar al-Sadiq was alive, there was someone else alive as well. His name was Imam Abu Hanifa. The Sultan of the time was Abu Jafar al-Mansur. He told him, Abu Hanif, I want you to be my Qadi. He says, I don't want to be the Qadi. He says, but you must be my Qadi. He says, I don't want to be the Qadi. So what does he do? 
He says, I'm going to lash you, I'm going to whoop you. He says, whoop me, but I don't want to be your qadi. And Imam Abu Hanifa was whooped to within an inch of his life. There was another person called Imam Malik ibn Anas, living in Medina at the same time. And he was narrating a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Laysa ala al-mustakrahi yameen. If a person is forced to take an oath, that oath doesn't apply to him. He's not bound by that oath any longer. The Sultan, the Khalifa of the time, had a problem with that because many a times those Khalifas force people to take the oath of allegiance to them. And the narration of a hadith such as this has certain implications for those Khulafa. And a message is sent to Imam Malik, you better stop narrating this hadith or else. Imam Malik says, this hadith is a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I will narrate the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No one will come between me and the dissemination of knowledge. The Sultan warns him, he continues narrating a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is taken into custody and whipped to such an extent that his arm is completely dislocated. His back is filled with lashes thereafter. But he did not stand back in, the, in, the, in what? In the face of Batil. If Haq was to be upheld, he did not speak in a, in, with a forked tongue. He spoke with justice, he spoke with courage, he spoke with bravery. Then later on there was who? Imam Shafi'i rahmatullahi alayhi goes down to Yemen, he is brought from Yemen in chains because he's accused of, in, of conspiring against the government of the time. He's brought marching from chains through the heat of the desert, but he doesn't speak in a forked tongue. He doesn't, he does not compromise principle, doesn't compromise truth. Truth is truth. After him there is Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahmatullahi alayhi. At that time, the Khalifa of the time was who? Al-Ma'moon wanted to force everyone into the Mu'tazi belief that the Quran is created. Many were those who gave in. Many were those afraid of the whip, afraid of the sword, who gave in for the sake of the Khalifa forced them. Ahmad ibn Hanbal, rahmatullahi alayhi, stands man alone. And he takes the punishment that the Khalifa heaps upon him. He is lashed and lashed again and lashed a third time till he almost expires, he almost dies from that lashing, but he says, Haq will remain Haq, the Quran is the uncreated word of Allah. These were men who were prepared to give their lives for the sake of Haq. Are we to believe that the descendants of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the de descendants of Asadullah al-Ghalib, Ali ibn Abi Talib, had so little courage, had so little bravery, that for the least little reason they would resort to taqiyya, that they would tell people, at taqiyya to dini wa dinu abai, taqiyya is my deen and the deen of my fathers, to the extent that they would even say, at taqiyya to tis'atu a'ashari deen, nine tenths of our religion is taqiyya. Why? Is this how people pay respect to the Ahlul Bayt? Take the taqiyya even further. In the time of the khilaf of Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu, in the time of the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu. Sayyidina Ali had a daughter, young daughter, just into her teens. Her name was Umm Kulthum. Sayyidina Umar wants to be connected to the family of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He proposes marriage to the young daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib gives his daughter Umm Kulthum in marriage to Umar ibn al-Khattab. She bears a child from him. Zayd ibn Umar is the son of that Umm Kulthum bint Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is a major problem for the Shia. Is this that same Umar who's going to be worse than Shaitan? Who's the Fir'aun of this Ummah? Is, can this be the same person? So they have various different ways of explaining it away. The one says Taqiyya, you know Ali was forced to do so. You and I, if we have daughters and someone comes and says, the gangster comes to your house and says, give your daughter or else. Are you going to give your daughter there? No, we are asked to believe that Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib had so little courage, had so little backbone within him, that he just gave in and gave his daughter to Umar. Which Umar? That Shaitan called Umar. That's one way of explaining it. Three different riwayat in Furu'ul Kafi state, affirm the fact that Umm Kulthum was married to Umar ibn al-Khattab. One of them go on to state something which very difficult to translate in front of everyone. They say Imam Jafar al Sadiq is asked about, asked about Umm Kulthum. He says, Hada awwalu farjin minna. This 
and I'm going to try and be somewhat ordent like about this translation, this is the first of our women that was forcibly possessed. This is Umm Kulthum, daughter of Ali, daughter of Fatima, granddaughter of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Someone comes along and tells us that this woman was forcibly possessed by Umar ibn al-Khattab. Some others have a different explanation. When they found that this kind of explanations don't work, they say, no, you see, what really happened was this, that when Umar came to Ali and said that give your daughter or else, Ali found that he could do very little. But he was possessed of powers, supernatural powers. So what he did, he called a female jinniya. Female jinni transformed her into the shape of a mukultum and said, you go and live with Umar. When Umar died, he called her back and he transformed her back into a jinn shape and said, now you go back home. This is how we explain history. This is history now. This here is a story of Qutbuddin Rawand in his book Al-Jarayh al kharaj wal jarayh This is how we are supposed to understand what the Ahlul Bayt were like. That when they couldn't, then they would resort to means such as this. Another story. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu had how many sons? All of us know he had Hassan and Hussein. But he had other sons after Hassan and Hussein as well. After Sayyida Fatima radiallahu anha passed away eight, uh, six months after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he married other wives. And he had a lot of other sons. And one son was called Abu Bakr. And one son was called Umar. And one son was called Uthman. So she has said they got the explanation for that too. She had to make taqiyya. Some way it has to stop. So they had one explanation. They say one day someone heard Sayyidina Ali calling his son Uthman. So he said, how could you call his son Uthman? He said, no, I didn't call him after Uthman ibn Affan. That's a bad one. I called him after Uthman ibn Mad'un, that great Sahabi. So then, if that was Uthman ibn Mad'un, Abu Bakr was named after who? And Umar was then named after who? And was Ali ibn Abi Talib the only one who named his sons Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman? And this, forget our Sunni sources. Go to Kitabul Irshad of Sheikh Mufid. It's translated in English and can be found with the Shias. Go in there, the names of the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib are listed there. Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, they are listed there as well. And Hassan ibn Ali had a number of sons. Two of his sons were called Umar and Uthman. And Hussein ibn Ali had a son called Umar. And Zain al-Abidin had a son, uh, two sons called Abu Bakr and Umar. And Musa al kazim one of the twelve Imams, had a son called Abu Bakr and Umar and a daughter called Aisha. What do we learn from there? We learn from there the love and respect that existed between the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and the Ahlul Bayt. Do we find any kind of in, in, in indication in here that the Sahaba were such enemies of the Ahlul Bayt that they oppressed them at every point, that they took away their haq whenever they wanted to, and for that reason that they will be the worst of people who are the biggest of kuffar for whom only that lowest pit of Jahannam is fit. There is something very, very wrong with that kind of idea of history. Something extremely wrong with that idea of history which says that on the one hand you find this very good sahaba, on the other a uh, very bad sahaba, uh, and on the other hand you find the Ahlul Bayt that have gone to a status higher than that of the Anbiya. This is part and parcel of what Imama is all about. This is what we speak about when we say wala and bara. This is what little Shia children are brought up to believe. That you have to love the Ahlul Bayt and you have to hate the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. Therefore, when the Mahdi comes and here, yeah, we share the essential idea of a Mahdi. We also believe there will be a Mahdi. He will be from the Ahlul Bayt. The Shia also have the same idea. But the personality of the Mahdi and the deeds of that Mahdi is completely different to what we have. They say, when that Mahdi comes, he will march upon Makkah and Medina. When he comes to Medina, he will dig out those two evil fellows where they lie next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He will dig their bodies out and crucify it upon a tree. And the people will ask him, obviously those people are not of his followers, those people will be normal Muslims, Sunnis. They ask him, why are you doing this? He says, you wait and see. So he crucifies those two bodies on that tree and suddenly that dead tree blooms into life. Suddenly the flowers come out, suddenly the leaves come out. And the people say, Mahdi, we knew there was something wrong with you. There's not something wrong with these two bodies. Look at the barakah of these two bodies on this tree. Look at what has happened. He says, this was only to deceive you. This was only to test you. Now I know that you are Sunnis and then he will burn their bodies and kill all the rest of those people as well. So don't think the Mahdi is coming for... America and for 
All those other enemies of Islam. He's coming for who first of all? He's coming for Abu Bakr. He's coming for Umar. He's coming for Aisha whose body will be dug out of Jannatul Baqi because she must be given the punishment of zina because na'udhu billah she was guilty of the sin of zina after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is part and parcel of the history that is not being given out there. This kind of history won't be dispensed out there. But this is the kind of history which will eventually, not now, eventually it will come into play. With the history such as this, how much grounds as if, uh, uh, how, how much grounds still remain for unity? What can we say? Can we have unity? Can't we have unity? Despite everything that we have said, despite the depth of the hurt and the anger that we feel as the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah when we hear this kind of statements. Despite all of that, I will still go to the extent of saying that it is possible to have that unity provided. What's the proviso? The proviso is that the Shia start the dialogue from within their own house. What kind of dialogue? Not that kind of dialogue which will be you cannot expect us to simply believe what you say simply because you say it. Because we know that it is part and parcel of that particular religion to twist the truth, to bend the truth sometimes for the sake of what is expedient. It's part and parcel of that religion. Go and look in the books of the Shia. What is the meaning of Inna akramakum atqakum. You and I think that it means that the most noble of people is the one who has the most taqwa? No. As the Imams of the Shia, they say the most noble of people are, is he who makes the most taqiyya. Atqakum means he who makes the most taqiyya. So when we are faced with people such as this dialogue, what kind of dialogue is there going to be? It is undeniable that within the ranks of the Shias, there are reformers. There are those who want to get away from this old history. There are those who say that we've had enough, this can't go on. That the bridge that divides us from the Ahlul Sunnah, it will continue growing further and further. That big yawning chasm which separates us, it will just grow further and further away, unless these issues are addressed. That dialogue, we say, we've got no part in that dialogue. We are the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. We have been here. We have been for three centuries or more at this particular part of the world. We need no one to come and inform us that our deen is not valid any longer. Least of all, we need someone who still hasn't fixed up, who still hasn't decided where he stands in his own religion. We need, do not need such a person to come tell us what our religion is supposed to be all about. There is a need for dialogue. That dialogue must start within the house of the Shia. They themselves must revisit these issues. Those of them have come forward and said that yes, we have to abandon the idea that the Quran has been corrupted. We have to abandon the idea of the sabbu sahaba, of the cursing of the sahaba, and making kufr of the sahaba. All the, those who are prepared to do so must however realize that that's not where it ends. You cannot simply say I no longer accept this but I accept that. You know what? That same person who has narrated a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt to tell you make salah in this particular way, that same person narrated the hadith of the Sahaba and the hadith of the Quran as well. Are you going to accept him as a valid authority here and reject him as an authority there? If you reject him as an authority when he narrates this kind of things about the Sahaba, you must reject him as an authority when he tells you you make salah with the stone in front of you as well. One of the things that come up a lot, that we as Ahlul Sunnah are probably going to face with a lot, you know, there are certain instances, certain major events in these lives of ours where you have to get together and do certain things together. And one of those incidents is going to be, you know, the time when someone dies. Then we come together, Salatul Janazah is going to be performed. Many a times, if it's a mixed family, someone asked the question a while ago, what if you have someone in the family is a Shi'i and so on. And we have had instances of people coming and saying, look, I'm a Shi'i, my father might be a Sunni, but I'm in charge, I'm taking his body, I'm taking it to the vet road, we're making our own salah upon it. How much do we know of what the fiqh of the Shi'a teaches about Janazah Salah? Did you know what the Shi'a are instructed to read when they make Salatul Janazah upon a Sunni body? Listen to it. 
you and I know first takbir we need what? Fatiha. Second takbir we need salawat ala nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Third takbir we make dua for that dead person. The Shia also make dua. If it's one of them, by the way, they make five takbirs. We make four, they make five. But after the third takbir, what do they do? If the person is one of them, they make dua of istighfar. If that person is not one of them, listen to the dua that they say the imams taught them. Allahumma akhzi abdaka fi ibadika wa biladik. اللهم أصله أشد نارك اللهم أذق حر عذابك اللهم ملعن فلانا عبدك ألف لعنة مؤتلفة غير مختلفة اللهم أخز عبدك في عبادك وبلادك وأصله حر نارك وأذقه شر عذابك Before translating this year first the incident where it comes from a person dies in Medina Imam Ali ibn Hussein is going for the janaza one of his Alleged Shia followers say, Imam, you're going for the janazah of this munafiq. Now, I'm using the word munafiq, it comes in that hadith there. Ayatullah Abu al Qasim al Khoi. Ayatullah Abu al Qasim al Khoi was the great Shi'i marja, the great Shi'i leader whom they follow in matters of deen. He died in about the early 90s, not too long ago then. He says, What is meant by a munafiq here? Munkirul wilaya. You don't believe in Imam, you're a munafiq. So the Imam is going for the janazah salah of a munafiq. His follower tells him, are you going for the janazah? He says, you come with me, stand next to me, and listen carefully to what I read, then you'll know how to conduct yourself when you go to the janazah of a sunni. You must read, Allahumma akhzi abdaka fi ibadika wa biladik. Oh Allah, disgrace the servant of yours between all your other servants in, in all your lands. Allahumma aslihi ashadda narik. Allah make him burn in the most intense of your fires. Allahumma adhiqhu harra adhabik. Allah let him taste the heat of your adhab. Allahumma mal'an fulanan. Allah curse this person. Alfa la'natin. One thousand curses upon him. Mu'talifatan ghayra mukhtalifa. One thousand curses all together at once, not separated. And then the dua goes again. Allahumma akhzi abdaka fi ibadi. And it goes on. This is that particular thing called a Ja'fari madhab. Now you and I, Sunni, Shafi'i, Hanafi, when we make dua for one another, we make dua of istighfar for one another. This is not just another madhab. Last week we spoke about this thing called the Ja'fari madhab. The Ja'fari madhab, this very word and the very idea, the very attempt to identify and equate the Shia with the Madhaib of the Ahlul Sunnah is a deception in itself. In the year 1743, 1743, what happened? In Iran, 200 years, 250 years before that, the Shia dynasty of the Safavids took over. Two and a half centuries later, that's, that dynasty crumbled. The of Afghans attacked them and they crumbled. The Safavid dynasty died forever. Some, a new leader took over in Iran. He was called Nadir Shah. Nadir Shah took over and he once again brought stability into the lands of the, of the Shia of Iran. But then he realized something. He realized what is the reason why there is always enmity between Iran and its neighbors. To the east, Iran had Afghanistan. Sunnis, they have problems with them. All the time there's war raging between themselves and Afghanistan. To the west, they had the Ottoman Empire. Constant war with the Ottoman Empire. If you want stability within your own home, how are you going to gain that stability? Not simply by waging war, by negotiating. So what does he do? He comes to Najaf. He comes to the city of Najaf. He brings the ulama of the Ahlul Sunnah and Shia together. From his side, there comes the Mullah Bashi Ali Akbar. His chief mullah is called Ali Akbar. From Baghdad, there comes the, Shaf the, the Shafi'i Mufti of Baghdad, Shaykh Abdullah Suwaidi. Shaykh Abdullah Suwaidi and Mullah Ali Akbar engage in a debate for several days. At the end of this particular debate, they all get together and they're going to write a farman. They're going to write a statement. And eventually, Nadir Shah would then write a letter to the Ottoman Empire and to the Ottoman ulama. This statement is, has been preserved has been translated several times. This statement states the following. The Shia are the followers of Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. They are just the Ja'fari madhab. The other madhahib are the followers of Abu Hanifa, Malik, Ahmad, and uh, al-Shafi'i. There's no difference between them. However, the Persians, on account of having been misled by the ulama for so many years, 
have indulged in the habit of cursing the Sahaba and doing all these kind of things that cause that caused hurt and injury to the heart of the fellow Sunnis, but now we have decided to eradicate this practice once and for all. What will the Shia Madhab become? It will just become a Jafari Madhab. What about all those excrescences, all those unnatural outgrowths of the Shia that go to the extent of denying the validity of the Quran and saying things about the Sahaba? He said that has come to an end. We're never going to indulge in that any longer. This is what we are prepared to offer the Sunni world. In return, we want something from you. From the Sunni world. What is it that they want? Now around the Kaaba in those days there were four maqams. The old people, the old shuyukh who studied in the Makkah will still remember. There was a maqam Shafi'i, there was a maqam Hanafi. In other words, the Shafi'i imam when he leads the salah, he will stand there with the maqam Ibrahim is on that side. The Hanafi imam will stand there with the Hatimis. And the Hanbal imam and the Malik imam. Each one has a maqam. Ja uh, what's his name? Nadir Shah says, I want a fifth maqam for the Ja'fari madhab. And then something else, he says, every year, one of the madahib get the chance to be the Amirul Hajj. One of the ulama from one of the madahib is appointed as the leader of the Hajj of that year. We want one year to lead the delegation of Hajj with the Ja'fari madhab as well. This was a very positive step because it shows that people are prepared to get out of the past, forget all of those things, proscribe it, take it away, throw it away, eradicate it, and just move forward. What was the result? The result was that Nadir Shah was assassinated by his own people. Why was he assassinated? Those who assassinated, those who assassinated him, they accused him that he had abandoned Shiism. He had not abandoned Shiism. He tried to reform Shiism. The fact of the matter is Shiism does not want to be reformed. They did not want to be reformed. In British India, every year on the 10th of Muharram, they used to take place this Muharram commemorative gatherings. In those things, the Shias used to have it, and then they start cursing. When they start cursing, it starts off from where? It starts off from Yazid. It goes on to Muawiyah. It's not, it won't be a hundred years before whose name starts coming in? The original usurpers, Abu Bakr and Umar. Sunnis obviously are not going to sit still when that happens. And they responded. How did they respond? Sometimes the responses took the form of violence. Sometimes the response took the form of something else. What was it, something else? alternative processions in which they go out and speak about Madhu Sahaba, in which they praise the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. But inevitably, these two processions would come to clash with one another, fights would ensue, and what will happen? They'll start killing one another. Blood will be shed. So the British decided, in 1920, the British decided, this was about 27 years before the independence of India. 1920, the British decided they will no longer allow Shia celeb uh, commemorative uh, gatherings coming out in the streets. You want to have it, have it in your masajid, have it in your Husayniyas, have it in your Imam Maras, but not in the street. And you Sunnis want to have gatherings when you speak about Sahaba, have it in your masajid, nothing public any longer. So anyway, that was since 1920, almost 100 years, it's about 90 years. In the late 1980s, the Shia of India, the 60 years, 60, almost 70 years, since the original banning order by the British, when India became independent, that same banning order was just kept in place. No Sunnis, no Shias, don't come out on the street and make uh, trouble. Just stay at home or stay in your masajid. In the late 1980s, two Shia persons arguing protesting for the right to bring out those processions in the street and publicly curse not just Yazid and Muawiyah but Abu Bakr and Umar as well. They protesting and they protest took which form? They immolated themselves publicly. They burned themselves publicly to say we are prepared to go to this extent but the right of cursing the Sahaba belongs to us. We want that right back. This is how deeply this idea lies within them because remember what we said Originally, to them, the idea of loving the Ahlul Bayt has to be exactly equal to hating the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. When they come into societies such as ours, however, they know that those who, we, who they regard as the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt lie very, very close to our hearts. Therefore, they will adopt a different method. When they come to us and say, well, we don't hate the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. When they start saying that Hadrat Abu Bakr and Hadrat Umar and all of these things, then we should ask ourselves, is this something really honest? Or is it a blatant insult to the intelligence of the Ahlul Sunnah? 
When we go into the Shia literature and read certain things in the books, they say, don't read the books. Don't read the books. Ask us what we believe. I tend to believe that the books are a better reflection than that particular Shia walking on the street. Because when they write the book, the chances of taqiyya are much, much less. However, when they speak to you, that tongue is known to be a forked tongue. That tongue, that tongue, its forkedness, the way it speaks, in its double speak, its tongue in cheekness is something which they believe now that the Imams had also taught them. Therefore, they will always resort to things such as this nature. Those amongst the Shia who really believe in reform will have to start this particular debate amongst them. To speak, to just give an example, to give um, something to judge it by, something to understand what it works like. In this country of ours, since 1961, when the Union of South Africa became the Republic of South Africa, there was a party ruling this country. That party was called the National Party. Those old chaps, Verwurt and Foster and Malan, P.V. Buota and all of those chaps, they ruled this country once upon a time and eventually it came to an end with the rule of F.W. de Klerk. But the National Party did not come to an end. It still went on. F.W. went and Martinez came along and Gerald came along and a few other fellows like that. Eventually what happened to the National Party? There's no National Party any longer. Why not? Because they realized what the National Party stood for once upon a time cannot be perpetuated in the new South Africa any longer. The kind of things that we associated with the National Party, whether you call it a new National Party or an old National Party, it's still the National Party. So Martinez van Skalkweg took a very, very logical step and closed the party. Why? That party had no role to play here any longer. They realized something, that baggage of the past, it's not something just shed it and move along. That baggage of the past, not just shed it, shed it and close shop. Say that that particular part of history is over, that party is over, go and join the ANC, go and join the DA, for that matter, go and join the Freedom Front. But the National Party cannot exist any longer. It has no role. What is required right now? From amongst the ranks of the Shia, there have to be those men courageous enough, brave enough, honest enough to start making the necessary changes, going to the real depth, not just a few cosmetic changes on the outside. Cosmetic changes remind us too much of that taqiyya, of saying that we love the Sahaba and all of that. No, not just that. It is something that has to be much further reaching than just saying we don't curse the Sahaba any longer, that we don't believe in tahrif of the Quran any longer. You don't believe in tahrif of the Quran, but you still rely upon those very same ulama who said that tahrif of the Quran was there. You're not prepared to say that by saying so they went out of the fold of Islam. Why is that so? Because those ulama of theirs who made those statements, who said these things about the Sahaba, these are the cornerstones of Shiism. If these cornerstones are taken out, the entire edifice of Shiism comes crumbling down. So while they are prepared to say we don't curse the Sahaba, we ask what do you say about those who do curse the Sahaba? When you, when, while you are prepared to say that we don't believe that the Quran has been tampered with, are you prepared to reject? Are you prepared to reject that entire legacy of the Shayyu, the Fiqh and the Hadith and the Aqidah and the Tafsir of all those people who said these things? That's where they draw the line. That's where they won't go beyond it. This is the call today. The call is not that the Ahlul Sunnah must convert to Shiism. The call is that Shiism must start realizing that there's something very, very wrong within their house. As long as that is not addressed, there is no way that we're going to move for unity further. Unity is possible. These are the requirements. These are the provisions. These are the shurut. Once these conditions are fulfilled, then we can speak to one another. Before that, it will be very, very difficult to speak anything along those lines. And the way this applied uh, in the Ahlul Sunnah and Jama'ah. We read in Maulana Manzor Nongman's book 
um, the Iranian revolution and the Shia belief. He quotes about five ayahs of the Quran, which they say Sayyidina Ali's name is missing. Now, as we all know, none of the Sahaba's names are mentioned in the Quran except Zaid. Uh, I'm just thinking in his uh, conclusion remarks, it doesn't come out very clearly stating that the people who has this belief of anything that's deleted from the Quran or added to it or alteration of any nature is out of the fold of Islam, he is kafir. Now I'm just wondering why he does not make the statement that the person is in fact kafir. Shukran. Rejecting anything that is ma'loom min adlin bil darura, anything that is categorically and undeniably on the basis of undeniable evidence, part and parcel of deen, the rejection of any such aspect of deen takes you out of the fold of Islam. Um, in the case of the Quran, salamatul Quran min al ziyada wal nuqsan, the fact that the Quran is free and safe from any addition and any interpolation, any subtraction, that is something to us, the Ahlu Sunnah wal Jama'ah, which is most certainly one of the daruriyat of deen. Because Allah Ta'ala had said, inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun, Allah is looking after it. And con uh, you know, contemporary research has shown it. That there is very, very, there's no difference between the Mus'has of today and the Mus'has of many, many years ago. So it is something that there is no difference of opinion about whatsoever. From our side, the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, denial of any such a thing definitely takes a person out of the fold. However, with the Shia, we find that something happens. What happens? When we tell them that you people say things of this nature, they have a response. The response is, well, I don't believe it. If that person says, I don't believe it, I can't hold him responsible for a belief which he denies. If he says, if you tell him, yes, in the book, he says, it can be in the book, but I still don't, don't believe it. Then our ulama, there are two different approaches amongst them. There is a one approach which says, you're not going to fool me. You are just making taqiyya, therefore, the fatwa of kufr would apply to you as well. On the other hand, there are those who would be more precautious and say, well, if you say so, I take you at your word, but that still doesn't absolve Shiism in general. Shiism in general does contain this belief. It does contain the belief, so there is something wrong. Can we apply kufr to a person who denies it? That's a question. We, on which ulama have taken different approaches. Some will say, you don't fool me, I'm going to uh, declare kufr up, uh, upon a person like that. Others will say kufr is a very, very severe thing. Only applied where the grounds are, very, very clear, uh, completely above question. Whichever of the two routes we take, it does not absolve Shiism in general of the fact that it does contain statements of this nature. So it's perhaps on account of the seriousness of takfir, the seriousness of declaring a person a kafir, that some, that some ulama have stopped short just before that. As for the other side, have the Shia ever stopped short? He might not declare you a kafir. He might not declare the Ahlu Sunnah in general kuffar. But when we read the literature, we see that what? The Ahlu Sunnah in general are kuffar, and the worst of kuffar are the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum. Um, Maulana, Maulana, in Maulana, Maulana, in terms of the disaki van takia, and ik denk baie van die broers wat hier sit, die dochters, 
en daar is possibly een boy of twee of drie boys wat vaak om die jaren. Een van hulle, sy daar zo, met die strategie dat hy takkie het. What tools do we have to be able to dissect his belief so that we can show to our daughter that this is certainly not the man for you? Well, Taqiyya is going to be extremely difficult. Why? Because he is prepared to say anything that you want him to say. He is going to be prepared to say any little thing that, that you want him to say because he wants to achieve what he wants to achieve there at the end of the day. The point is, is he a Sunni or is he a Shi'i? If he is a Shi'i, if he's prepared to say that he is a Shi'i, and then thereafter he's prepared to capitulate on just about anything, you know, when you tell him, what do you say about Abu Bakr Umar? And he has some good things to say. And what do you say about the Quran? And what do you say about the Sahaba? I think these are clear indications that this person is already busy with some form of taqiyya or the other. In a case like that, the father steps in and tells his daughter till year no further. Such a person must not be allowed. Um, because it, it's only going to lead to further encroachment upon the society of ours. Right now at this moment, nikah is being utilized as a tool of encroachment, as a cool tool of expansion. As I mentioned last week on the website of the Ahlul Bayt Foundation, it is written there that one of the objectives is what? To slowly, gradually swell the numbers of the Shia in this country of ours. This is one of the ways in which they are going to do it. Um, once one finds out, look, if this person, if you ask him a question or two in terms of what you've learned about Wala Bara, about Sahaba, Quran and so on, and he's prepared to give you the kind of answers that you want to, then definitely he's making taqiyya. That's good enough, I think. Assalamu alaikum, Olana. Um, just on the Tukia itself again, um, I would just like to know, will you be, like you were doing with the Imama topic itself, using the Quran, just to say that the thought pattern is not right, will you be using the Quran again to say the same with Tukia? Because I mean, they probably use the Quran as well to justify how they use that. Will you be going into that as well as a, as a topic? Oh, certainly. Everything from day one already, I think, here, we started from where? From the Quran. And beyond that, how much do we really need? Most certainly the Quran has ample indication of the fact that taqiyya is a wrong thing. Yes, most certainly. And that the Quran contains also an indication of the circumstances under which taqiyya can be made. What will be done then, inshallah, this will come in future lectures. It will be done there, spelled out exactly where it can be made, where it cannot be made, and where the Shia took it beyond its acceptable limits. Inshallah. Shukran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Well, now it's quite um, fascinating that you started off right at the beginning of the talk about the two concepts, the extreme love, the extreme hate. When, however, you speak about the unity uh, between the Shias and the Sunnis, firstly, you would, you would always preface it with an extreme horrific example, and thereafter you leave the question in the air, saying that we can have dialogue and we should have dialogue, but with these kind of horrific examples, is dialogue possible? The second attachment to that is that you always speak about the other horrible issues that the Shias are busy with, and you then also poses the question that the Shias again must first get their house in order before we are prepared to talk to them. But you speak fondly about that there are such reformists, and you've even given the uh, one example of the one scholar that was assassinated. Now, it kind of leaves one with pregnant almost with ambiguity. Are the reformers? And if they are reformers, can we start? What practical steps can we take to engage them on a, in a beautiful manner? Yes. May I just ask the brother, why is it that you find such a problem with these horrific examples? No. Are they true or are they not true? No, no, no. I, I, no. I've, I've said right from the beginning that there's no way that I can check the veracity of these statements mm -hmm. because I don't have a, 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 a Shia giving a, a Shiaism from me, a Shia oh, perspective. Oh, I thought you had. I thought you had. I honestly did. Well, no, I do. I mean, I, th there's no question. I facilitate programs, yes. And there's no argument about that. And so you do have I'm, access? No. You do have access to a Shia scholar to ask him to check? Yes. But I you do. haven't been doing that? No, of course. 
Have you checked anything? Yeah, no, but not in a No, no, no. Have you checked anything thus far? But that's one and one. Uh, yes or no? Have you checked anything? Yes. Tell me something that you've checked. No, no, no. <laughs> because that's... the questions come very regularly, but no. the checking doesn't happen, you see? No, Molna, I, I, I would, no, I would really not indulge the, I mean, this Jama. I mean, Let's go are, back to no, your no. first question. These are horrific examples. Okay, the talking is between myself and my brother. The talk, I, what I'm simply trying to... I'm just trying to say the following. Would you think it is necessary that people know about these things? You see, because what's going to happen, there's going to be a good Shiism and a bad Shiism. There's going to be a good Shiism and a bad Shiism. In order for us, if I have your attention, in order for us to know the good Shiism, we first need to know the bad one. The poet says, عَرَفْتُ الشَّرَّ لَا لِلشَّرِّ لَكِنْ لِتَوَقِّيهِ وَمَنْ لَا يَعْرِفِ الشَّرَّ مِنَ الْخَيْرِ يَقَعْ فِيهِ If you don't know the difference between bad and good, you're going to fall into the bad. So it's necessary, unfortunately, in this country of ours, when truth and reconciliation came around, people had to speak. Someone had to go up there on that stage and say that I killed this one. We cannot today... You know, just sweep under the carpet that Biko was killed and Timon was killed and Imam Harun was killed. These things need to come out. It needs to be stated. And then reconciliation can come. So we need to speak about these horrific things. It's, it's not, therefore I started here off by saying, it's not a pleasure sitting here. It's not a pleasure. But it's something that people have a right to know. And you see, everyone calls for unity. How would you like... If prior to 94, everyone said, let's have unity, but don't speak about Imam Harun now. Don't speak about uh, the Biko and, 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 and the Sharpville Six and Boy Patong and all these other massacres. Don't speak about them. Let's just all sit together, have a nice South African braai, and after that you can all sing, uh, sing Kozi Zikalele and everything is nice again. No, we need to visit these issues. We need to know. I know it's uncomfortable for you. But these are the catharsis processes which we have to go through. If you cannot realize the need for that, if all that you're going to do is more, you know, post-mortems on the radio, you still haven't understood why we have come together here. You still haven't understood. The, the door is open. We are prepared to engage. But those Shia reformers should not be engaging with us. We know what we believe. They've, they've come to our country. They, have you been, brother? Have you been to Devet Road? Have you seen who are the people who attend there? They are Capetonians. They are people from this society. They've converted. Why did they convert? Because they were converted. Now, who did that? Were those reformers Shia or those Shias of the old Ben still? I don't have the answer. If you have it, please tell me. But who needs to engage here? My idea of telling you last week, and I, this is probably going to be taken out of context again like so many other things on your program but what I meant last week by saying that you need to get your house in order is this those who come and invite towards Shiism, those who come to Sunni communities and call upon their children to convert to their way of life what right have they to do that when their own house is not in order when there are reformers and there are counter reformers those reformers and counter reformers have got to come together and decide what is really the religion of the aqidah of shiism once we know that then we are prepared to engage with those of them whose ideas we can we can identify with if we're going to find a shi'i then prepare to say i don't believe x and y and z and everything else connected to it then by all means but if he tells me, I don't believe in tahrif of Quran, but I still make salah like this, because you see, uh, Zurara ibn A'yan narrated that hadith there, I don't accept him. But Zurara narrated this hadith and he accepts him, there's something wrong with it. So, once again, this is our call. You have the air, please announce it next week on the radio. That this forum calls, that the Shia have dialogue within themselves. Decide what are they, reformers or counter-reformers, and then come to us. Then we accept you with open arms. Sheikh can, can run. Shukran Maulana, I think that uh, 
this particular program I can remember that 10 years ago that this particular situation has come up before I think Molina is explaining it in a better way nice way for us my why 10 years ago you didn't stand up it's being said it's because certainly now it's people are those who, who indeed those individuals are, are, are getting the clothes into them people are I've, I've been mentioning this saying that you know what the din is between me I'm not interested in Shia and Sunni it's between me and Allah so, so there's a lot of a lot of confusion going on as well Shukran. you know this reminds me just before the American attack on Baghdad just before the American attack on Baghdad, America made certain demands. Saddam must do this and he must do that and he must do that. One of the things which he must do, any anti-aircraft air power that they have, they must remove them. Then only we won't attack you. Why was that? Just so when the anti-aircraft power was gone, then the aircraft came. So we're not prepared to relinquish our anti-aircraft. We're going to maintain it because we've learned our lesson. Assalamu alaikum I just want to ask a question on taqiyya, Mulna. Um, we know that our belief in Iman is aman to billahi wa malaikati. So when a person lies continuously, can Mulna tell us if the malaika befriend that person or not? If a person lies continuously, if a person lies continuously, what happens is, inna rajula la yazalu yakdibu hatta yuktaba inda Allahi kathaba. His name is written by Allah as a liar. When he's a continuous liar, lying, 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 then Allah calls him a liar. When Allah calls him a liar, the rest of creation will know such a person, person as a liar. I would want to say that the Shia also believe that lying is not permissible. But they say there's a difference between lying and taqiyya. Taqiyya is lying for a good purpose. And, you know, kadib is lying for a bad purpose. So you become what they call Machiavellian, that the end justifies the means. If the end is we're going to get more Shias, we're going to convert more Shias, then you can lie and you can do a number of different things. It's fine. No problem. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh Taha. Wa alaikum As you have so uh, beautifully said, that this, uh, this people's um, main concern is to swell the numbers on their nets. Um, my question is, should someone then innocently finds himself in the Salatul Janaza, not knowingly that the Imam is maybe a Shi'i. And uh, as we know, the Ahl Sunnah, we have four takbirat, and they have five. What should we as the Ahl Sunnah do? If you don't know that the Imam is a Shi'i, and he goes on to five takbirat, you stop at the fourth takbir. Um, you can go on to the fifth takbir as well. There is a view such as that you'll never know um, or rather, you know now for a fact that the person is a Shi'i. Now, this particular dua that I read to you, this dua is found in about 20 different riwayat in Wasail al Shi'a. Every Shi'i out there doesn't know this. This is just part of the Shi'i legacy. You see, when they come into societies such as ours, they put their best foot forward. The veteran up to today is putting the best foot forward. It's not going to tell a person, because you remember, his own mother and father is still Sunni. So he's not going to tell him, you know, when your mother and father die, do this. These kind of changes will only come after a while when the society is ready. For example, one of the things that the Shia have to give, you and I have to pay how, how, what percentage of zakah? Two and a half percent of zakah? The Shia pay two and a half percent of zakah plus another 20 percent which they call hummus. They have to pay 22, so all in all, it's 22 percent. When they came to South Africa originally, when the Alul Bayt Foundation Center opened up here originally, no one was being taught about, uh, no one taught them about, you've got to pay 22 percent. Only now, a few years ago, they started teaching it. Because back then, you tell a person, brother, become a Shi, it's very nice to be a Shi, you've got to pay 22 percent of income. Hadi Buddha Sev, Sunni is ma, right ma? But after a while, these teachings come. So uh, if you're faced with a situation where the, the Imam is a Shi'i and he says, uh, and he makes five takbirat, the first and, first and foremost thing I would want to tell the Shi'a, um, whichever one of them is present, they'll probably hear, is that their own madhab permits them, in terms of the riwayat of their imma, their own uh, hadith permit them, their own instructions of the Imam permit them to make only four. If they were the Sunni community, why insist upon being different when your own riwayat say you can do the same? 
at least do it for the sake of the unity. Don't show that we are different. But those that were here last week will remember something. They have to show that they are different. Why? Because in their belief, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum left no stone unturned to corrupt things. So if their own madhab allows them to make four and four alone, and it so happens that the Shi'i happens to be the Imam, let him make four takbirat and let him not cause any uh, confusion amongst the public. For them to go and insist upon five takbirat, that's making a statement. You want to be known as someone different. When you have this kind of latitude within your madhab, make use of it by all means. This is probably one of the ways in which we can find some common grounds. But if you constantly want to be different, there is going to be a problem. I've got a question, I've got a question. I just want to ask the brother, if after this we are going to do the Qadianis, is there going to be a series on the Qadianis on radio as well? Yes, one and the same thing. Well, you know, with, with, with enormous respect, I, I, I think, I think this, this conversation was extremely unfair. Firstly and foremost, I'm not at your level. I'm just an ordinary Joe public, if you like. No, no, you're a no, no. you, you do conduct a program. I just want to know. I, Maulina, would you have a similar program no, for Qadi? No, no, is no. it only special favor for Shia? No, no. With respect. And, and, and I think, and I think this All is All your I, questions I've taken. Every question that you've asked, I've taken. I've taken time to answer. In fact, I think I might just have spent more time on your question than anyone else's so far. I've got one question. The answer is a yes or a no. After this, we intend to do the Ahmadis. Are you going to have a similar session with Ahmadis as well? You're asking me whether I'm going to be here? By Allah's will, yes. I will be in the education. No, no, not here. Education. On your radio program, will you do a post-mortem on the programs that we'll have on the Ahmadis as I'm well? I'm not sure, Molna. Mm -hmm. but, but, but I think it's unfair, really. No, no, uh, there's nothing unfair. I, I re no, I really think with respect it's unfair. What I would have wanted, really, was that scholars at your level, and I, and I think I said this right from the outset, scholars at your level, if, if, if you could debate... Right, with the authors that you always reference and cite at that level. And, and no, the, but you know can, that I, can I just make one observation with really with, with, with your indulgence? The uh, fact that we have so many ulama. Before that, I'm going to allow you 30 seconds of it. No, Sheikh, let him speak, Sheikh. No, I thought Mullah was asking me a question. No, no, Sheikh. He can, he can speak. No. The, the fact that I like the so circumlocution. The fact that we have. You know, we're talking around the issue, not on the issue. The fact that we have so many ulama sitting here, literally at your feet. Because it's such a new phenomenon, the study of Shiism. We have so many ulama who are resident imams in many masajid across Western Cape. Can you imagine if learned scholars are sitting at your feet, Mullah, every Monday night, me as an ignoramus comparing to the learned scholars here, that we have so much to learn. I don't and think you still understand the question. The question is, would you be prepared to get an Ahmadi Qadiani scholar on a program on radio to do a dissection of a program that we will have here. I don't think it's part of radio policy, no. It's not? No. It's Why? Not part of, it's not part of radio policy. I'm not part of radio policy. I said from the outset, I'm a facilitator. We have an education program. So there's a bit of, there's, there's a, I think the radio needs a further, further bit of reform. You must understand, no, no, no. Ahmad, uh, from our particular no, really, point of view, no. Uh, no, Ahmadism really. has been here before Qadia, before the Shia. We, we, Why do the Shia get special privileges? Tell, just tell me that. Why do the Shia get special privileges? When certain things in, in Shiism go way beyond anything that the Qadian has ever said. That is exactly Everyone why is said. prepared. Everyone is prepared to give the fatwa. Even Buddha Mustafa the fatwa gave on Kufur Tirani That's why I said it's Everyone so unfair. Everyone is prepared. But why, the, why the, are the Shia toes so sensitive? It's not sensitive. Why do we all the, jump the on the bandwagon of the no, Ahmadis? It's never but been when it's about the, the Shias. Oh. It's about the unity. And all my, but if the records will show every time has we radio about 786 question, ever tried to make unity with the Ahmadis? We have a record, lots of them. You've done? No, 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 no. We have record, we had, we have tried. you made unity with the Ahmadis? No, please. No, no, I'm asking. Any programs on the Ahmadis? Simple.
Yes or no? Mona, you can't engage me. Mona, you can't. Sorry. This is not, brother. This is not. This is not the alim question. No, but that's precisely this is not the alim point. question. This is simply the question of a. There's no. a question of a person whose name gets bandied around on radio these days. No, Molana. No. Yes. So no. I just want to know no. because I want to know. You know, is my name going to get bandied when I take go for the Ahmadis as well, and maybe the Baha'is as well, and maybe who else? Or is this just special treatment for the Shia? No. It's not special treatment for the no. Shia. No. I, th I think it's unfair. The, the whole premise is unfair. I can't engage with an alim like you. No, I can't. This is not the, this is not the intellectual question, not an academic yes. question. You, sh you should, don't avoid the question. I'm not. Answer it. <laughs> yes, you can answer it. But Molina, at least answer it. Molina, Molina, I have said from the start, and if I'm going to be called a champion for unity, because we have a model in South Africa that we can show to the world, we have a vast majority of Sunnis in this country, and the minority is Shias. Where no, no, before come, the Shias, no, 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 they were no, no, the Qadianis. I want to get to a point. I want to get to a point, right? Now, there's no need for fear. In my understanding, there's no need for fear. Yes, education is necessary. Islam is about education. There is no ambiguity, no misunderstanding about that. The issue was about unity. Is, that was is unity an and absolute concept or a relative one? And my last question was that whenever you speak about unity, you always preface it with a horrific example. Uh, I've answered that one already. No. I've answered that one already. And I was gonna get because to the unity UCT. cannot happen until we revisit those other things. And then I was going to get to the UCT example where you said that the pamphlet was given by the Ahlul Bayt Center. I didn't see the pamphlet. But in your submission, you said that the pamphlet said that there's respect for Sayyidina Abu Bakr, there's respect for Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu, yes? And you expect me to believe that? No, that is the point. I was going to engage you in that. I was going to ask you, coming to, your, to, to one of your primary issues that you raised about the extreme love and the extreme hate, was it not supposed to have then demonstrated from our side, first the love, that if a pamphlet said there's respect, should we not engage them in that? But yeah. then you immediately followed it up by saying, but they have a history where they twist. And Do you deny the that they have that history? I don't. You see, that's the point. I don't. So know. you need to know it. Therefore, I'm telling you. But you need to know what to believe and what not to believe. But that's exactly. I, do you believe everything that everyone says? How about for Wood? If for Wood wrote you a nice poem in Afrikaans about the great man that Nelson Mandela is, would you accept that? Where does the no? I think that sometimes there are a few things here. The first, of, uh, first thing is that double standards. The double standards, and that's what I'm trying to get you to, to see, and you're talking around the issue. We don't treat the Shia the same way we treat the Ahmadis. As far as we, the Ahlul Sunnah, is concerned, that is also a sect, and that is also a sect. Within any of those sects, whether it's called the ABC sect, the Qadian is the Shia or the XYZ sect. We have to determine whom we can have unity with and whom we cannot have unity with. Unity is not such an absolute thing that rides roughshod over everyone. I would like you to pose the question to Sheikh Shahid next week, whether the Agha Khani Shia are also Muslim and whether we should have unity with them. Those who believe that Ali is a God and that the, the Imam right now, Karim Agha Khan is also a God. Does that... Uh, you know that eye of unity that you uh, discussed over does it apply to them as well or are there certain limitations to it if you have limitations so have we I don't believe that I don't believe there was a you and me in the first place more with respect but what I am saying in the, the question I want to know are there any reformers in the Shia group that we have in South Africa and is it possible is it possible to forge unity with those who are reformed and those who are for Lech? They are reformers. The question is that we need to see what validity do those reformers have within their own Shia school. For example, I'll give you the example of one reformer. You might have heard his name, you might not have. Ahmad al-Katib. His proper name is Abdul Karim Lari. He wrote several books in which he has distanced himself from several things of the Shia. He believes himself to be a Shia reformer. What does the rest of Shiism say about him? There's a contract taken out on his name. I is full, full fray for Klar, as they say. Kill him, like Salman Rushdie. 
There's a fatwa on him. He can, that's a reformer. How have the Shia world responded to him? So if we have similar reformers, my suggestion to such reformers is Ashura is around the corner. Three, four weeks from now, it's going to start. Let them start those reforms from there. The reforms are not with us. The reforms are within the house of Shiism. Last week I said it, this week I said it. What validity do they bring from within the house of Shiism? How well do they represent Shiism? Do they represent Shiism or do they represent themselves? You know what many reformers? Simply, oh, I don't believe in this, I don't believe in that, I don't believe in that. Is that reform? That's not reform. That's not reform. Reform means going right down to the roots and looking where those things that you disagree with, where do they originate from? And revisiting those issues. And then you start reforming from there upwards. So if those reformers bring them, we'll engage with them here and tell them, this is how we conceive of reform. If they're prepared to do that reform, yeah, that reform will resonate with us very, very well. Our arms are open, we're prepared to embrace. But they're not prepared to do that. If it's merely a matter of, okay, now a checklist, that, 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 that I don't believe in, so I'm a reformer. That's very, very far from true reform. I think that's very, very far away from true reform. So the reformers need to decide for themselves what is their reform. Then those reformers need to go back to their co-religionists, to the people of the Shia, and get from them a stamp of approval to say, are you a true reformer and do the rest of the world of Shiism stand behind you? Or what do they say about you? In order that we can know whether this person speaks for all of Shiism or whether he only speaks for himself. If he only speaks for himself, what can we do with such reform? Thank you.